Good evening, everybody. I am Paula Croxon, Director of Public Programs for the Zuckerman Institute. And I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's Stavros Niakos Foundation Brain Insight Lecture. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to join me here virtually tonight as we continue to share our commitment to outstanding science and excellent programming. And we hope that tonight's presentation will not only leave you with a better understanding of the science happening here at the Zuckerman Institute, but also put our research into the context of everyday life. Before we start, I'd like to thank the Stavros Niakos Foundation and the many foundation members who join us here tonight for your continued partnership and commitment to helping us make brain science accessible to the public. And that has really never been more important than it is now. Tonight, you will all be treated to individual scientific presentations from two incredible speakers, followed by a conversation led by Columbia University's Dr. Erica Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is an NIH T32 and Helen Hay Whitney Fellow in the Saltzman Lab at Columbia University Zuckerman Institute. And the focus of her research is on how the dynamic social environment shapes emotional behavior in mice. Growing up in Queens, New York, Erica completed her undergraduate degrees in biology and neuroscience and psychology through the Macaulay Honors College at CUNY Queens. And she was fortunate to conduct two years of undergraduate research under the NIH's 234 Mark training grant, um, all the while competing with the varsity swim team. Her undergraduate research focused on the effects of unilateral vocal nerve resection on neurogenesis in the adult male zebra finches song system. Um, and Erica then went on to complete a PhD in neurobiology at Duke University with Dr. Fan Wang, where she studied and published her work on the role of the direct pathway um, of the trigeminal ganglion to parabrachial nucleus on facial pain in mice. So you can see she has a really wide range of interests um, and all of this brought her here to the Zuckerman Institute to continue um, working on the, the social environment um, and how it shapes behavior. Um, and in addition to all of her research work, Erica is a strong advocate and supports trainees in the scientific community and beyond. And tonight she's gonna to be moderating a fascinating conversation between our speakers. So just before I turn it over to Erica, I just want to remind you um, that if you haven't already submitted a question uh, for our speakers, and thank you if you submitted one in advance, you can also submit a question using the Q&A button at any time during the talk, and hopefully we will be able to address um, some of those questions at the end. So please join me now in welcoming, welcoming to the virtual stage, Dr. Erica Rodriguez. Thank you, Paula, for your kind introduction. So it's my pleasure to introduce this virtual event. In today's event, we will explore how the brain processes touch sensation, particularly gentle touch. We will also learn about how autistic people experience touch and how that can help us learn about touch in general. As Paula mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Dan Dr. Daniel Salzman's lab at the Zuckerman Institute. My research seeks to understand neural mechanisms underlying how individuals behave differently when in the presence of a diverse set of people. So for example, how one would behave with a boss or a nemesis versus with a close friend or a subordinate. And so for this reason, my interest to understand how our beautifully unique minds perceive and make decisions in this largely socially constructed world goes hand in hand with this event. As we learn about how our diverse brains process touch both mechanistically and behaviorally. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. Ishmael Abdusabor and Kirsten Lindsmith two experts who work in very different fields, the way the brain processes gentle touch and autism advocacy. We also hope that their talks provide complementary views, ways to understand how the brain processes touch in both neurotypical and autistic brains, and that this event will uncover the ways in which our understanding of each field can inform the other. In this event, we will hear two 15 minute talks, one from each speaker, after which I will moderate a discussion in which we will include questions from you, our audience. If you have already submitted a question, thank you. If you wish to submit a question, like Paula said, um, while the talks are in progress, please look for the Q&A button to submit your questions to the panelists. And please let us know if you're a teacher or a student. And if you're a student, tell us what grade you're in. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ishmael Abdusabor, received a doctorate in cell molecular biology from the University of Pennsylvania in 2012. 
After two years as a postdoctoral fellow at the Will Cornell Medical College, he then returned to the University of Pennsylvania where he continued his postdoctoral training and joined the faculty as an assistant professor of biology. In 2021, he moved to Columbia University where he is now currently an assistant professor of biological sciences. His lab currently investigates the neurobiology of pain and touch. So now please join me in welcoming Ishmael to the virtual stage. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here with you all and to share some of the work that's been going on in my lab. So I'll tell you about some emerging work where we're trying to connect the outside world, our skin, with internal representations in the brain to understand how rewarding such social touch may, may function and may work. So uh, to begin, um, I just wanna let you all know that it's a really exciting time for us in this field of somatic sensation or touch or pain. If, if people haven't uh, are unaware, this last year's Nobel uh, Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to, to, to two colleagues of mine, uh, David Julius and Artem Patapushian, who discovered receptors that allow us to sense pain and touch. And uh, these are really pioneering studies. And uh, I think we all would agree in the field, there's still so much work to be done. It's really the tip of the iceberg. So for example, Artem discovered a receptor for touch, a mechanoreceptor named PSO2. But just because PSO2 is activated in our skin, that doesn't tell us why a hug is rewarding, for example, how the brain profiles this activity in the periphery to make meaning and, and give value to these uh, peripheral sensations. So still a lot, a lot of work to be done. And I think that ties into what I, I'll tell you about now. So, so gentle stroking of the skin is rewarding to mammals. I think we all would appreciate that. It's essential in our daily lives for forming meaningful relationships with our loved ones and friends and partners. Um, and it's almost as if we're, we're hardwired to crave this sensation, like there are neurons, dedicated nerve cells in our skin that respond to the stroking touch and relay that information to our central nervous system, our brains, so that we, can, so that we uh, enjoy this sensation and find it rewarding and crave it, okay? So uh, it turns out we actually do have uh, neurons in our skin that appear to be tuned or specified for detecting gentle stroking touch. So they're called C low threshold mechanoreceptors, C LTMRs, or they're sometimes referred to as C tactile afferents in humans. So here's just a cartoon uh, of, uh, through the, uh, in the skin. You can see here these neurons uh, are, are color coded in red and they oftentimes uh, affiliate with hair follicles uh, in the skin. The idea being when you stroke across the skin surface, you would activate these neurons leading to a perception of, of gentle touch. All right, so what I'm going to do uh, to, to tell you about is some work in my lab and we use the mouse as a model system. So let me just give you an idea of why you, before I show you some of the work that we do, why would anyone even be interested in, in studying mice to learn about uh, touch in the brains of, of humans? So for those of you who may be unaware, the mouse is actually the most widely used model organisms, uh, organism in all of uh, biological research, just for understanding new uh, mechanisms of, of how nervous systems work and for therapeutic uh, pursuits. The mouse uh, has extreme similarity to you and I, so this is why they make good translational models. In terms of the number of genes, we have a, a similar uh, complement of genes, around 20,000. The physiology, the anatomy, the wiring of the nervous system is, is very analogous, So, which means the, some of the lessons that we learn in the mouse, we can extrapolate those to more complex systems like, like you and I. And for example, I mentioned there are 20,000 genes here. If, if I held out the complete uh, complement of, of uh, the DNA sequence of a human being and held that side by side to the, the, the genome of a mouse, you couldn't tell mouse from human because the, at the DNA level, there's so much uh, similarity, okay? Uh, there's a rich community of tools and resources. We've been using the mouse as a community for over a hundred years as a genetic system. So we built up a, a huge repertoire of different uh, techniques and tools we can use to interrogate the nervous system, for example. And in terms of drugs and therapy, the drugs that we use on a daily basis or, and take for granted, uh, they, the basic science oftentimes has started in the mouse and we need to test for effectiveness and safety in the mouse before we move them to the clinic. So they're, they're just vital components in the, the translational uh, therapeutic pipeline. And this lastly, of the, the many benefits of using the system, which is relevant for what I'll, I'll tell you about today and the work 
we all do broadly in neuroscience is that we can modulate neural circuits and freely behaving animals. We can do technologies where we can activate or in inactivate specific populations of neurons and see how this alters behavior, for example. Okay, with this, with this premise, let me get into some of the things that we do. So uh, there was this one paper that came out about 10 years ago from David Anderson's lab at Caltech. And I read this as a postdoc and got really fascinated uh, about this field because the Anderson lab identified in the mouse a population of those C uh, LTMR neurons I was talking about, those gentle touch detectors. And what they, uh, so this is shown here. So this, uh, these neurons are labeled by this gene called MRGPRB4. I'll just say B4 for short here. And they uh, put this, uh, this uh, genetically encoded calcium indicator into these neurons. They just use calcium as a proxy for neural activity. And what they were able to show is if you just stroke the flank of the mouse with the stroking touch, these neurons were activated via this calcium proxy, but not to something painful. So this is really cool because now this opens us up to be able to use the mouse to, to ask additional questions, some of which we were trying to get out in my lab. So we asked the question, uh, in the mouse at least, are there neurons that, we could, that are dedicated towards social stroking touch? And we reason that these neurons could uh, were a good candidate to, to fit that uh, to fit that description, but we needed to do experiments to try to prove that, and also we wanted to link this to the brain. So this is what I'll tell you about in my remaining uh, eight to ten minutes or so. So uh, what we did uh, was use a technique called optogenetics. So for those of you who are unaware, this is a, a mainstay technology in, in neuroscience. It's probably the most revolutionary technology in neuroscience since the, the advent of functional brain imaging, fMRI. Uh, and th the way this works, it makes use of these, these, cha these uh, protein channels called channel dopsins. They were actually origi originally harvested from uh, green algae, these simple uh, single cell microbes. Uh, and because of recombinant DNA, DNA technology, we can move DNA from one system to another. So we can, we've been able to, to, to clone and take this DNA from this algae and put it into a mouse or a rat or a worm or a fly or a monkey, et cetera. So in brief, how it works, uh, so here's this, this, this blue light sensitive ion channel. It sits on the, the surface of a membrane. And uh, when there's no blue light, the channel is off and it's closed. However, when you hit this channel with blue light, it opens uh, and allows positive ions to flood inside of the neuron. So neurons are electrically excitable cells. So this will be a signal to activate this neuron or lead to action potentials as shown here. So if you can put this, this protein, this channel dopsin on the surface of your neurons of interest, you can activate it in a behaving animal, a freely uh, behaving scenario. So what optogenetics allows us to do, it really solves a fundamental problem in the, neuros, in the nervous system, and that's the problem of scale. There's so many neurons, there are hundreds of millions of neurons. How could you activate one neuron without tar also modulating its partner? Well, optogenetics allows us to do that. You know, if, if, again, if, if, if this is a, a forest, for example, optogenetics allows us to go in there and activate individual trees within a forest of neurons. All right, so uh, what we did um, is use optogenetics, but different than some many of my colleagues in neuroscience uh, use this technology for. So a lot of colleagues will uh, stimulate neurons in the brain, but we reason what we did here was we genetically engineered a mouse where we put this opsin, this channel dopsin, into these touch neurons in the skin. And instead of shining light to neurons in the brain, we, we figured we could do skin optogenetics and turn on neurons directly in the skin to try to mimic or modulate social uh, touch. Okay, so this is just showing uh, here are our neurons that have this blue light sensitive channel dopsin. You can see this is a, a, a section through the hairy skin. Maybe hopefully you can appreciate there's a hair follicle here. All right, so let me show you how this looks when we do this behavior in vivo in a behaving mouse. So on the left is a, uh, a control animal, and this is a, a high speed video. So it's slow motion and it's black and white, as you can see. But here I'm pulsing blue light to this animal's back on the left. This is a control animal no response. The animal knows we're here, but doesn't really alter its behavior. But on the right, look at the response that we see in an experimental animal. We're shining the light to its back, and the animal is, uh, is behaving as if, we're, as if we're pressing down on its back, okay? Maybe you've done this with your cat, for example. If you press down or stroke the cat's back, it kind of lowers and adopts this, this posture. 
So we can just like good scientists, we can quantify this posture, just this sort of back dip or back lowering. And we see a nice statistical separation between our experimental versus control mice. And we've done this with another line that's, uh, has, that's related to genetically to this, these mice, but they don't do this behavior. So we think it's really specific to modulating this one population of these touch neurons. We next ask, well, how do, how do the animals interpret or, or how might they be feeling this sensation? The animals can't talk to us, so we have to put our detective caps on and try to design experiments to get at how they're perceiving the, the value of this sensation. So one way to do this are these so-called condition place preference assays, where here we essentially uh, trained an animal to associate uh, this blue light stimulation to its back with one arena versus a negative control green light stimulation to another arena. So we do this for five days. And then on the, final, the sixth day, we remove the lasers and ask the animal, where do you prefer to spend time? Uh, and lo and behold, we do see that these an experimental animals prefer to go back to the chambers where these neurons were stimulated in the back skin, all consistent with this being a rewarding, uh, preferable sensation to the animals uh, through their back skin. Uh, we do this again with a, a related uh, genetic line, and we don't see this uh, result. So we think this is really specific for this population of, of neurons. Um, so does this posture reflect a natural response to social touch? I don't have time to get into the, the, all the data, so I'll just summarize it really quickly here. So uh, what we think is that these neurons are involved in at least two different uh, natural, ethologically relevant social behaviors. So to get at this, we designed another uh, genetic strategy to genetically ablate these neurons. And when we did this, um, we have this one behavior that we're calling conspecific crawl, where the animals kind of uh, touch each other and just to anthropomorphize momentarily, it's almost like a mouse massage. And, and one mouse is, is kind of stroking the back of the other and the other, the recipient mouse kind of lays flat and, and adopts this posture. When we ablated these neurons, we see a reduction in this behavior. This uh, posture also reminded us of the lordosis female mating posture when animals uh, 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 mate. And, and when we ablated these neurons, we also saw a reduction in the, the, the females uh, adopting this mating uh, posture to the male attempts to, to touch and mount, okay? So these neurons are sufficient and necessary for these socially rewarding behaviors. And lastly, what I'll show you is that we were able to connect the skin to the brain. So we engineered another set of mice uh, here where, again, we do this skin optogenetics to turn on these neurons in the back skin, but here simultaneously we record uh, this reward signature in the brain, which is uh, dopamine release from the, uh, in the mesolimbic reward pathway in the nucleus accumbens. And here we use uh, optical strategies, again, something called fiber photometry and a, a dopamine sensor that gives us a, a real-time readout of dopamine release, this reward signature. And what we can see was that uh, we get a nice dopamine release this reward signal when we activate these neurons through the skin. Also not shown here, when we ablated these touch neurons uh, and we also measured this dopamine reward signature and in a uh, control normal animal during social encounters, we get a nice dopamine release, but we do not see that when we ablate our touch neurons. So, so taken together, we've identified this skin to brain pathway for rewarding social touch. We recently re wrote a review article to try to put some of our studies in the context of other studies in the field. You may be wondering, how do you get from the skin to these deep brain structures? Here's a putative circuit based off our work and some emerging work uh, in the field. All right, so just to summarize what I've talked about today, this work is, is still in revision, but there's a, a preprint article uh, if people are interested in more detail. But just to summarize uh, what I've talked about, uh, so we've sh shown that focal activation of these skin sensory neurons leads to these touch-dependent rewarding social postures. Uh, and work that I didn't have time to show, again, when we, the reciprocal is true, when we ablate these touch neurons, we see a reduction in touch-dependent uh, social postures. We've connected the skin to the brain, as I've mentioned. And, and this lastly, I'll leave you with, you know, what are some of the implications for uh, this work, especially in relation to tonight's uh, uh, meeting? Uh, so everything I showed you today is in a normal scenario. But, you know, one uh, uh, question to, 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 that one could ask from studies like this, you know, is this skin to brain pathway that we've identified here, might it be altered in neural atypical states like autism, where uh, in many autistic individuals, gentle touch is no longer rewarding. It's, it's actually aversive. 
or even if you think about changing the internal state, if you're in a state of, of fear or anxiety, you know, that, that normally stroking touch, if you're on the one train in, here in Manhattan and someone strokes you on the skin, uh, it catches you off guard, it's not going to be rewarding. It, it'll be aversive, right? So, so where's the plasticity in the system? How does this work? Um, and what happens when it goes awry and disease or neuroatypical states? I think these are questions that we can begin to address from some of the basic science studies that I've talked about today. So with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, the folks in my lab who did most of the work I talked about today. Here's a more recent photo of us and, and some of our, our funding uh, sources. And, and thank you all for allowing me to, to be here with you all today and share some of our work. Thank you so much, Ishmael, for that great talk. Remember, if you have a question, please use the Q&A button and we will try to answer them in the Q&A after the second talk. And so now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Kirsten Linsmith, who is an artist, writer, and autism advocate. After getting an ASD diagnosis at the age of 19, she's been working in the autism world in various capacities for over a decade. She currently works as a full-time software engineer and part-time autism consultant. Now, please join me in welcoming Kirsten to this virtual stage. Hello. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna get my get my presentation up for everybody. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about autism as a counterpoint. By the way, I loved Ishmael's comment about the context of the being on the crowded one train, someone touching you. I'm gonna use that now as an analogy of being autistic is like you're trapped on a crowded one train. <laughs> but um, anyway, that I guess I don't have like as much data to show in slides. So uh, I'm kind of just filling up whatever. So intro to me, here's photos of me as a child. Um, that, you know, as Erica said, I'm autistic, I'm an autistic adult, and I've been doing like various types of, you know, classroom teaching, different home therapies, like, um, you know, consulting, designing sensory accommodations, public speaking for like, like over 10 years now. So I have found myself in kind of a unique position that I've gotten really good at explaining the autistic experience to non-autistic people. So we're going to be talking about touch today. But I wanted to start by talking about autism and what is autism. Uh, that as many of you have probably noticed that there's been an increasingly mainstream presence of autism as a theme in pop culture. So I decided to you know, throw some stuff up on the slide that is pop culture autism-y. Uh, that I first wanted to uh, kind of address some like misconceptions about autism. Uh, the first is that it's important to kind of keep in mind that the old school historical view of autism and a lot of our records of autism and kind of how it's thought of uh, is as a list of observable behaviors, external uh, behaviors, social differences, sounds autistic people make, kind of a lot of uh, autism literature, especially historically now, is almost like an ethnography of, well, what are they doing? Uh, without a lot of context of why. Uh, another misconception is that autism is traditionally thought of as a developmental delay and a developmental disability. I personally think this is because so much of how our brains work is like kind of a manual transmission brain that because of that, we're kind of the canaries in the coal mine and we seem like children. So like uh, I, whenever I'm doing Zoom meetings, I'm constantly like shifting around and I have to put my feet up when I'm on a bus or something because it like hurts me to sit still for too long. And I think that it hurts everybody and that most people just kind of suck it up and I can't suck it up. Uh, another thing is that, you know, kind of a misconception about touch and autism uh, is that like one of the things that Ishmael said, which isn't like, you know, this isn't his area of expertise, this isn't a knock against him, but there's an often a uh, common mindset that autistic people just don't like to be touched and that touch, uh, social touch especially, that's, you know, good in general is like bad for autistic people. And that specifically, I would say the misconception is autism as a monolith. So I wanna talk about, well, what is autism really like? What are autistic people really like? Uh, I, again, don't have a lot of data, so I just filled up the screen with famous people who are somewhere on the autism spectrum to give you something to look at. Uh, we're very diverse, uh, but autistic people are not a monolith, and especially when it comes to sensory things, which uh, used to be not really thought of with autism. Again, the ethnography, the external behaviors, the, the sensory aspect wasn't even really noticed, and then it was seen as like behaviors that 
sensory component of autism is extremely, extremely major, and that not all autistic people are the same. In fact, no two autistic people are the same, and often it's difficult to find people who are similar, and it's kind of fun to find like your sensory twin. Uh, that some autistic people are sensory avoidant is the term, and some are sensory seeking. Uh, and that some people who you know may really really hate loud sounds lights anything there are arguably at least in my experience just as many autistic people who seek these things out and like obsessively crave them and like will you know listen to way too loud music unless you stop them kind of thing uh and that most i won't say all because i feel like that's just you know we're talking about science i don't want to be inaccurate and claim that I know all, but so most autistic people are a combination of both sensory seeking and sensory avoidant, as I think all humans are. Uh, and again, just the autism being kind of the canary in the coal mine that it's like, we're more extreme in things that all people kind of experience, that someone who hates loud sounds might crave touch. I once worked with um, a student who was constantly touching every surface and like the rougher or even more painful the surface was the more he wanted to be touching it but he hated loud sounds and would like run from a loud sound uh that the combination or the profile of sensory seeking versus avoidance is often you know dependent on the person dependent on the context and dependent on the type of sensory stimulation um and i think one of my favorite examples of context with sensory input is that like old study i don't even know what this is i like i probably should have googled but i remember hearing it in the 90s about some study where people who were smelling like their favorite cheese said that it was delicious but if they were told that it was smelly socks they said that the smell was disgusting and you know context is everything uh so but today we're talking specifically about touch again, just to reorient. So again, we're coming back to this misconception about autistic people hate touch or don't like to be touched as uh, this. There is a clear differential between uh, social touch and other types of touch. And if anything, I, I find it really interesting that autistic people can sometimes illustrate this really well of that uh, autistic people who are sensitive to touch, uh, especially in a negative way, uh, will usually be sensitive to all touch. Like, I hate itchy tags in my clothes, an itchy tag that a normal person apparently can just, like, ignore. Be like, oh, that sucks, but I'll just wait until I, like, can ignore it. Like, I can't just ever ignore it, so I have to rip them out and have holes in my clothes that uh, doesn't matter whether it's social or not. But there is something unique about social touch uh and that some sensory seeking autistic people will still hate social touch specifically and interestingly many social touch avoidant autistic people will still love touching animals and uh how much of this is wrapped up in social trauma is unclear it's really hard to differentiate Growing up autistic in a neurotypical culture inherently comes with some level of social trauma. So that might be one reason that, you know, getting an autistic kid a dog is almost universally beneficial because, you know, this is something that uh, is difficult for autistic people and whether or not it's their sensory profile and it's just the social aspect is sometimes unclear. But uh, I, I personally believe that touch and social touch is very very important to everybody and autistic people crave it and need it and just because of all of you know these complicating factors get less of it uh and another thing that i would add is that i personally feel that it's not so much that as a usually sensory avoidant like you know i like the right kind of sensory but i'm picky as a sensory avoidant person it's not that i hate touch or that i don't like to be touched it's that touch is extremely important it's like most input in general, but especially something like touch. My brain can't ignore it. So like if I'm introduced to somebody and have to shake their hand, I will not remember their name because touching their hand and shaking their hand like absolutely takes over my brain. Uh, it feels really invasive at worst. And uh, it's regardless, it's again, it's not that it's bad, it's that it's important and social touch more so than other types of touch i think it is this unconscious my brain knows that it's important and it's like 
you're, you know, you're being hijacked by something. Eye contact feels very similar of that if you look someone in the eyes, it feels like you're being taken over and you can't think about anything else. You can't process anything else. And I've heard similar reports from other reports from other autistic people about how the importance is something that kind of lends to the, the negatives as well as the positives. Uh, so I wanted to get into you know, like a little more science. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist again. Like I have a biology undergrad degree, whatever. That um, interestingly enough, despite sensory processing being so different for autistic people, or in my opinion, in in my opinion, potentially because of it, sensory stimulation uh, can often be extremely beneficial in autism therapies and also things that I've seen and heard over the years of in therapies for things other than autism like you know besides sensory integration of just trying to deal with visual scanning and things that autistic people often struggle with that uh adding sensory cueing to parkinson's therapy apparently has a noticeable benefit in the effects of the therapies and then other types of learning disabilities besides autism uh even you know types of pain management you can read the slide psychiatric care all those types of things that including sensory therapies in other types of treatments in general does seem to potentially have an effect. Uh, also, I find it interesting that dry brushing, I have a little dry brush here, that dry brushing, which is something that's often used for um, autism therapy, people who hate being touched and like it's painful, uh, just, you know, a few minutes a day of dry brushing, like up and down the arms and legs, uh, like a couple times a day over, over time makes touch just easier to bear, more comfortable, less painful for some reason. We don't, people like Ishmael are probably figuring out why, uh, that I know a few uh, physical therapists who use dry brushing in their practice for neurotypical patients who are say uh, recovering from surgery and have um, you know, a lot of pain around a certain joint or something that they'll often prescribe dry brushing before other exercises, just to kind of like, get acclimated to the idea of touching the area and whatever that there does seem to be some level of benefit here and it's not again it's not quite clear why and that's what we're getting at but i do love seeing the things that uh i've seen help autistic people and help me are things that seem to help everybody uh so uh i wanted to Said a lot, I'm like kind of throwing up random things in my slides here, but uh, that uh, autism in general is a very sensory experience. Uh, that my personal description of it has always been a combination of, you know, we're the canaries in the coal mine, things that we need are things that help everybody else, and things that help other people are things that we need. Uh, but also, that while autism is often thought of as like, you know, social or behavioral kind of thing. Uh, it's a very sensory uh, worldview, world experience. Um, and that this kind of canary in the coal mine effect that sensory things that other people don't realize are hurting them or can live without or whatever are things that make a huge difference in autistic people's lives. Uh, and I personally have found through the fact that like, I, I like need sensory things. I carry like, you know, little stim toys and stuff with me everywhere that uh, these things that I need to, you know, kind of function optimally are things that everybody benefits from. And, you know, past jobs that I've had in like restaurants or whatever, that if I bring stim toys to like, you know, my workstation, like I used to be a hostess in a restaurant and I would bring stim toys to the front desk area that the other employees, the servers and so on, who would like kind of make fun of it would end up taking them and using them and like calming down and recentering. And that I personally think that anyone can benefit from what I think of as sensory health and, you know, kind of safe, positive sensory input and stimulation that the type of things that people do naturally without thinking like uh you know playing with your hair tapping you know especially around the mouth this nerve here is very calming so people will often do this when they're stressed touching around the mouth tapping your foot when you're listening to music nodding your head these are all types of stimming that are all us kind of trying to regulate ourselves and the things that autistic people do 
are often like I'm spinning in my chair a little bit just all the time, that are things that I think help everybody in the way that, you know, doing a little meditation, doing a little yoga, like try doing a little bit of facial massage or like get a fidget spinner or something to keep at your desk. Uh, I've in a lot of the schools that I've been in either to teach or like, you know, to do sensory design or just tour do speaking or whatever that I've really become a fan of integrated classrooms, either with, you know, a couple autistic students or a neurotypical completely whatever normal classroom in a school that has a lot of autistic students so there's a general awareness of it will have you know sensory toy bins for breaks so that you know kids when they ask for breaks can go like play with a fidget you know get in one of those stretchy sacks and stuff that it gives kids of all ages high schoolers are sometimes the worst at this who don't know how to actually rest who don't yet have the skills to regulate themselves or like actually get the most out of break productively can rest and rejuvenate during a break when they would otherwise be like on their phones or just, I don't know, some doodle, whatever, just regular things kids do that a healthy way to, you know, the kid who'd otherwise be running around the classroom or something or the teenagers gossiping that uh, it gives something healthy and regulating and restful that teaches actual coping skills. So anyway, I'm gonna wrap up according to my self timer. I have about 30 seconds left. So I'm gonna end on, I have a blog. I almost never update it these days because I'm really busy, but you can read some things that I've written about autism. Uh, and God, talking for only 15 minutes is difficult for me. But I just want to say, everybody, if anybody is into self-care, like get some stim toys, get some fun textures, like it is good for you, I swear. Hit the 15 minute. Ooh, oh my God, I'm so proud of myself. I want to keep talking, but I won't. I'm sorry. Thank <laughs> you so much, Kirsten. <laughs> it was a great talk. Um, so now I will invite Ishmael to join us for a discussion where we'll answer some of your questions. I'll unmute. All right. So maybe I will start off with, since we ended with Kirsten, let's go with this one question. So is sensory stimulation more um, tolerable if the autistic person is the one who initiates it? Um, I'm assuming you mean tolerable for the autistic person. Uh, I will yeah. say uh, yes, and I feel like a lot of it is because, again, the canary in the coal mine thing, that think of Ishmael's wonderful analogy of being on the crowded one train, people all in on you. If someone just touches you, like, and you're not expecting it, and you're in this overstimulating environment, like, oh my god. But if you are like, you're, you know, like, oh, oh say there's an open seat next to you and someone like sits down and like bumps up against you and you're like, oh my God, a crowded train, like it's not nice. If you're the one who sits down and you're prepared, you like kind of bump against the person as you sit down, but you know it's coming. You're the one who's initiating it. It's a way more pleasant. <laughs> so would this feed into, um, so this is sort of like my curiosity, like uh, an issue of dealing with novel objects or a novel environment or context versus something that's familiar? Is this like a general thing that you experience where novel things are just like too much, too, too novel for you, too overwhelming? I definitely think so. In, as a, a generality, autistic people have a difficulty with abstraction and generalizing and kind of um, big picture thinking. The it, It's called central coherence of taking pieces and putting them together into a whole. And that what this means in practice is that everything is novel. I once participated in a TMS study like God, like eight years ago or something where they did find like noticeably heightened neuroplasticity in autistic people of all parts of the spectrum. And that kind of plays into how I feel like my life is that like, you know, neurons that fire together, wire together. If your neurons are like too plastic, you're not really making efficient pathways. Everything is new all the time. <laughs> so uh, autistic people love repetition, love the familiar. I love rewatching TV shows and rereading books. I feel like part of it is this, like everything is novel. 
reducing the novelty is inherently comforting. Ishmael, do you have any like thoughts on that? Yeah, I've, uh, you know, as, as a basic scientist and not an, you know, autism researcher, um, you know, again, thinking a lot about the skin, the brain sort of pathways and I kind of ended on this a little bit, like where does the plasticity reside and, you know, novel versus familiar, for example, um, and experience, like how does that impinge upon this, if you would, maybe labeled line from the skin, neurons in the skin to the spinal cord, to different brain areas, like where does the modulation occur, um, I think is an, an open question um, and a fascinating one. Yeah. Um, that actually feeds into a question I have. <laughs> so uh, do you think, uh, this is more for Ishmael, do you think that activating these touch neurons during like aversive stressful moments or even during learning a new skill would induce a refined neuroplasticity in areas involved in associative learning, such as the amygdala and therefore reduce anxiety, fear or enhance learning of that new skill? And can this neural mechanism be applied to how sensory therapy is beneficial? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we actually have an ongoing study in my lab looking at that. A PhD student, Melanie Schaffler, has been looking at this um, to see, you know, we have this pathway as I kind of laid out that you, you turn on, it appears to be rewarding. So a, a question that easily emerges from that is like, can it be, can it prevent anxiety, depression, stress? things of that nature. So, so those experiments are ongoing, but what I can say is that when, at least in the mouse, when we genetically ablate these touch neurons and then the animals uh, go through stressful environments, we see behaviors that are reminiscent or that, that teach us that the animals are not able to handle stress as much without having this pathway. And conversely, we're just starting to do some of this. It's not fully worked out, but we're trying to rescue some uh, anxiety and depression induced behaviors. If you can, if one believes you can study these things in a mouse, there's some contention about, you know, what, what does a depressed mouse look like or an anxious mouse, but there are some readouts that are, have been established uh, or uh, over the years in, in the literature that, that we're using. And, um, you know, we're seeing, can we alter or reduce some of these readouts in the mouse of depression and anxiety like behaviors through stimulating uh, this pathway with the, te the technique I showed today, optogenetics in a focalized manner or another common technique in neuroscience, chemogenetics, where we can do a body-wide pharmacogenetic activation of these neurons. And, and most recently, even as uh, in the last few weeks, we've been doing, uh, it reminds me a lot of what, what, what Kirsten was mentioning, we're doing experiments in the mouse where we, we are rubbing the mice with like cotton balls and soft brushes and um, and looking at how they respond, it seems like the, the animals find it rewarding. And we're asking, can that rescue some like stressful scenarios in a mouse by giving them this, this soft stroking caress, uh, which activates probably lots of multiple types of touch neurons, more than the ones that I've talked about today. Awesome. I love that. Putting um, an arm around someone when they're stressed. Hmm. Yeah. One, one thing, if, if I could, that I wanted to pick up on what Kirsten said, which I think is so fascinating, at least for me as a basic scientist interested in, in touch neurons in the skin, is this idea of like social touch versus other forms of touch, discriminative touch, for example. And at least on, on our basic science side, in the last you know five to 10 years, with, within our research community, we're starting to appreciate that there are different molecular genetic types of touch neurons. Uh, touch is not all the same. There's some neurons that, you know, you reach in your pocket to feel if you have a quarter or a dime and you use your fingertips to, to do this sensation. There are touch neurons that seem to mediate that versus the ones I talked about today, which are like social touch. So, you know, is it is it a, a, a far-fetched idea to believe that certain neuroatypical states like autism, for example, may um, target one type of touch neuron versus the other. And this could like be a, a mechanism to like explain some of the, the phenotypes we see. That's just a thought I had as, as you were talking. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, to add on that, it could be like different ratios of different touch receptors that are, you know, um, altered in these given that it is a spectrum disorder, 
and that you have diverse, you know, representation of autistic people, like there might be an explanation to that in terms of the ratio of the receptors. Um, awesome. Which so we study autism in mice. Because like, my my big worry is it's 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 mostly so difficult to separate the social cultural context of touch. So like I'm pretty certain that autistic people are processing social touch differently from like a clothing tag touching, but how much of someone who loves all touch, but social touch is just socially traumatized. Like that would be easier if it wasn't a human being that we were studying anyway. <laughs> um, so I've received a couple of questions that sort of touch on similar uh, topics in, in terms of, um, how do you ha how do how do you handle like nonverbal children that um, are autistic and you know because they are not giving you the feedback in terms of like is this good or bad um, and how can you uh, adjust the sensory therapies for that for those those groups of children? But I feel like this is something where different practitioners of different types of therapies have their own um, kind of techniques and their schools of thought around this, but. Uh, I personally, of the practices that I've done, uh, I feel like building a relationship first is the essential step because being autistic is really hard just <laughs> in general. And then especially in a world that is not like built for you, it's just extra difficult that, uh, and autistic people who are nonverbal, you know, can't speak, especially the younger they are, they don't have the tools to deal with the world like every kid, uh, that you basically live in a world where nobody respects you and everybody is constantly like hurting you or at least making you really uncomfortable constantly and there's nothing you can do to stop it. So uh, you're very much at risk of just creating a worse and worse situation for that kid and a bad relationship for yourself. So, uh, you know, building some sort of trust relationship first of like parallel play and showing like, I am not gonna do anything to you suddenly without you being aware of it. And if I'm touching you, I liked one of the occupational therapists I once worked with, that she had this really nice thing that she would do with, with all patients, but she would even do it to new patients that she called greeting the body, where she would basically, you know, reach out if it was a new patient and be like, I'm gonna touch you. And they'd like, no, like, what are you doing? But the, she'd do it again and just be like, I'm not going to move fast. I'm not going to do anything crazy, but I'm just, I'm going to touch you. <laughs> and like, we're going to do, we're going to do some of this and just like push on whatever part. And the, the more sessions she'd had with them and the more comfortable they were that they're like, okay, I know that when she reaches out, she's not going to do anything crazy. She's going to do the predictable, slow, like, just, it's fine. The, she would do like a very firm, deep pressure kind of, you know, shoulders, arms, face just like kind of touch everywhere smoothly but deep just to show like kind of set the stage of like i'm going to be touching you for our session but i'm not going to hurt you this is the worst it's going to be like now you have a frame of reference and if i do something you don't like you can like because they do you know communicate a person who can't talk is still communicating they're gonna like Ugh, if they don't like something <laughs> i'm just kind of showing this is the worst it's gonna get uh and I've gotten like flack for saying this before, but I really agree with Temple Grandin, especially I think, cause I think like her, I'm very like visual and the way I think is very visual that like uh, people who are really good with animals tend to be really good with autistic people. Cause animals also have a sensory oriented umwelt of like, you know, if you're petting a cat and it attacks you out of nowhere, then you're not reading its signals. <laughs> and like, you know, watch, watch for like, does its face change like if you're trying to you know if you're trying to reach out and like hug your your niece or nephew or something like do they even know you're there are you surprising them come up beside them and kind of like hey i'm here <laughs> like let them reach out just like i don't know you wouldn't you wouldn't do it to a cat with claws so don't do it to a person <laughs> mm -hmm. awesome Great advice. <laughs> um, here's an interesting question. So uh, this is a question from the audience coming from the ADHD corner of neurodivergency and having trouble thinking of that as a single thing. I'm curious as to what 
you think is the most responsible way for researchers to study ASD without failing into the trap, falling into the trap of treating it as a monolith. Sometimes it seems that we just started adding the word spectrum without fully embracing that. What I'm most interested in are studies that, and, and really I think the best way around this, is trying to recruit from as many different like parts of the spectrum as you can, especially like, um, I also, I would love to see, I'm sure there are studies on what is the line between ADHD and autism. I personally consider ADHD to be autism light and they occur in families very similarly but that like uh um like the tms study that i was participating in that they were um basically just doing really basic things i wasn't doing the, the further stuff of just you know zap see how long the threshold takes to reset uh have you do a beanbag game flip it upside down see how long it takes to learn and measure the threshold potential and stuff and that they were doing that to people on you know all areas of the spectrum and that that's why it was such a big deal to me that they found this heightened neuroplasticity in all of the autistic people that they studied and they the, their criteria was just you have to have an official diagnosis it doesn't matter whether you can talk what your iq is all of this stuff if you have a diagnosis we're putting you in the autism pool and that compared to a neurotypical person who was assessed as not autistic who you know had you know different uh reset rate of the threshold potential compared to this whole group that are all so so different but the one thing they have in common is an official autism diagnosis like okay what are the things that are in common because i mean hopefully someday we'll be able to have more empirical tests of like i feel like there are maybe subtypes within autism of like the different types of sensory profiles or what who knows but uh i think accounting for intentionally trying to recruit as many different types of autistic people uh, as possible is helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know, did you have any thoughts on that, Ishmael? Yeah, I, I, just on the, on the basic side, you know, I'm not a, a pure autism researcher, but I have a number of colleagues who are, and, you know, they try to study autism in a range of model organisms from, from rodents to invertebrates and and one approach that scientists like to take is, um, you know, on the human side, there's been uh, a huge push with these so-called GWAS studies or uh, genome-wide association studies where, um, and other methods where you can sequence a person's genome who may have autism and, and try to make a causal association between uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, a change in a DNA sequence in a given gene and the autism, uh, 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 disorder. Um, uh, so, you know, can you take some of these these genes and um, or mutations, if you will, or changes in the DNA sequence you find in human populations, and then model this in a mouse, for example? I mentioned that there's there's synteny, there there's similarity between the DNA structure of a human versus a mouse. If you make the equivalent change in a mouse, where we have a lot more control over being able to modulate genes. Um, you know, does this produce a mouse that has, you know, features of autism? And I think some of that work is, is emerging. And, you know, I think trying to model a disease in a, in a mouse, for example, you're not going to, you lose the, the complexity that we have in our natural environments, but there are probably some aspects of the, the phenotype that one can study. So I think there, there is, is, is great hope in trying to use model organisms to, to get at the basic biology of how a system works. And if you have a disease gene that may lead to some autistic print, uh, uh, phenotypes or behaviors, you know, what's going awry in the, in the brain and in neurocircuitry? And can we think about ways to, to modulate that, to, to alter it, to, to fix it? And, and, you know, maybe this is pie in the sky, but, you know, can you take what you learn in a, in a mouse, for example, and extrapolate that to, to larger populations? Um, especially if, if you look at things that arise from changes in DNA sequences. We're in an era where we can mo modify genomes using genome engineering technology. It's not available to use in humans yet, but it will be in our lifetimes in the foreseeable future, things like CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So it, it's not uh, beyond uh, a reason to think that maybe we could, there could be some curative sorts of ways to look at this by altering uh, genes that that can alter behavior and things like autism, for example. 
the empirical autism test or the empirical gene genotype for autism is definitely the holy grail of like imagine if you could like just be like you know what i don't want getting my hands wet to be painful anymore like something like that one day uh i i just want to say i i saw a question in the chat about romantic relationships and i think i can answer that very briefly by saying i'm going to highlight that i said that autistic it's not that autistic people don't like touch it's that touch is very important and context-based there we go um so let's see here's a pre-submitted question so what are the ages developmental stages or developmental stages that different kinds of touches are important for infants and toddlers either of us qualified to answer that <laughs> <laughs> or so I'm like, I know some I know, yes, I know yes. some things, but like just in the like, okay. So um okay, last question. So besides the groups that you mentioned, can anyone and everyone, and you kind of said this at the end, can everyone benefit from sensory therapy? And what are ways we all can use this? And if one does not readily have access to an occupational therapist, are there ways one can perform sensory therapy at home? I, I would say, yes, of course, I already said this, but the, the thing that makes the biggest difference uh, that's the easiest to do that I've found is being aware of things that are like bad for you sensory wise that you wouldn't necessarily consciously notice like how bright are the lights in the room you're in and where are they is the lighting directly overhead and pointed at you or is it pointed is it indirect is the lighting pointed at the wall reflecting off is it you know wall sconces anything diffused that like i didn't even notice overhead lighting was hurting me until i went to an autism conference like like a ways into my autism career where, you know, a guy with a brimmed hat was like, here I am in the autism uniform, you know, these lights. Uh, and I went back home, was like feeling nauseous in a room and was like, oh, that's the same kind of lighting that he said. And I did this and felt better immediately that like one of the first sensory accommodations that I do in like schools or whatever places is like turn off the overhead lighting and get a lamp. And all of the neurotypical people, when I turn off the overhead fluorescent lights in a school, will go, oh, like they just don't notice. Again, the, the canary in the coal mine thing of like autism, lack of self-awareness, neurotypical lack of just being able to bear unpleasant things. Uh, like, are you too cold? Have you moved your body recently? Are your joints getting stiff? How bright are the lights? Like, are you hungry? Like all these little things that when you take care of them and treat yourself gently, like your life will be way better and you won't necessarily have noticed how bad it was until you take away the bad input. That'd be fast. No, nope, perfect timing. So um, I think that is all the time we have. Thank you for Thank you all for attending this event and thanks again to both of our speakers for joining us today. Please take two minutes to fill out the survey, which we will put in the chat and let us know what you thought about today's event. We would love to hear uh, and we would appreciate any feedback. Thank you so much. I'm just finding the survey link that I can put into the chat here. and We would love to hear your feedback. Um, thank you so much, Ishmael, Kirsten, and Erica for that really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much if you submitted questions. We're sorry we didn't have time to get to all of them. We did our best. Um, we really hope you enjoyed tonight's program um, and that you will join us in the fall where, when our events in this series will resume. Um, and of course, I hope you will continue to stay healthy and have a wonderful summer. Thank you so much and good night.